United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, Superintendent Tager, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? No, we do not. Okay, thank you. And I know we have uh, public comments. Um, I would like to start with uh, Sam Connor Self. If you could please uh, jump on in. Okay, so so Sam, we'll we'll try to come back to you, um, or we okay. will come back. Oh. Are you Are, there, Sam? Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Perfect. Oh, awesome. Sorry about that. I'm still not great at Zoom. <laughs> well, trust um, us, we can relate. <laughs> so, like I said, my name is Sam. I am going to be a senior at Bangor High School this coming fall, and I am here to introduce. Main Youth Powers Voter Education and Accessibility Campaign for the high school. So voting is a huge part of our American democracy. However, when questioned, students are faster to recite Romeo and Juliet from memory long before they can provide many important details about our voting process. Um, education is the best way to empower, educate, and motivate the next generation to be active participants in our government. It is with this in mind that we, Maine Youth Power, are here today. We've seen a gap in our voting education and we want to work with the district to change that. We want to empower our peers, future generations of Bangor students, and students across the state of Maine. We have formulated these demands for a comprehensive voter education and accessibility plan. The first is at least half a day off on election day for voting age students and faculty to be able to vote. The second is transportation to and from polling locations in Bangor for students on election day. The third is voting will be an excused absence. No detention will be received by a student for voting. The next is Bangor High School will host a voter registration drive for all faculty and eligible, eligible students. Bangor High School will host an absentee ballot request drive for all faculty and eligible students. Bangor High School will increase voter education available to students 17 years old and older. This can be in the form of an assembly or incorporated into the curriculum. So these are the ideas that we have come up with to elaborate more on the importance of this issue and to share her own story. Um, is Jordan Miller, who is a Bangor class of 2020 graduate. And uh, Sam, could and I, I apologize because I failed to ask you a question. Um, what yeah. is your residence? 75 Bellevue Ave. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Thank you very much for that. And a perfect segue because Jordan uh, Miller is the next person uh, to do a public comment. Jordan, if you could give me your name. Um, and your residence as well, that would be lovely. Um, not sure. I know. Okay. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Great, my residence is 47 Pine Trail and that's in Dedham. Thank you, Jordan. So, hi everybody. Um, I would like to begin by thanking the committee for allowing me to speak here today. Um, as I said, my name is Jordan and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am a 2020 graduate of Bangor High. I graduated Bangor High in the middle of a high stakes election for young people and became involved in voter outreach and education during this election. And this is how I ended up becoming a fellow for Maine Youth Power a new youth organization working to create a better future for Maine and its young people. I reached out to current Bangor students to start this campaign because in my time at Bangor High, I noticed a large disconnect between students and voting. I did not know a lot about the voting process. For example, how ranked choice voting worked here in the state of Maine, how to request and send in an absentee ballot, or 
even that I was eligible to vote in primaries at 17. This information is knowledge that all students have a right to know and have access to. And it is also the school's responsibility to prepare their students for the future. And therefore we are asking for the expansion of voter education and accessibility at Bangor High School. And this is even more crucial now as Maine is often passing new legislation surrounding voting. A few others and I met with the Bangor High principal, Mr. Butler, to discuss the demands of the students. This campaign is here to build upon what the high school currently offers and ensure that every student knows how to exercise their right to vote. As of now, Mr. Butler has agreed to meet us on some of the demands and has generated a few ideas on how to meet them. And we are here talking to you all today because we want the school to be held accountable if these changes are not made. We are open and willing to have conversations and work with the school to ensure an increase in voter education and accessibility. It is also important to note that this campaign does not end at Bangor. It has only started at Bangor. After this, Maine Youth Power, we are going to be talking with other students in high schools across Maine and working with them to create this campaign in their schools. Right now, Bangor has the great opportunity to be a leader in a soon to be statewide movement and this campaign gives Bangor schools and its students a win. Thank you for your time. And I hope that you will all stand in support with this campaign. Thank you very much, Jordan. Um, next, we have Morgan, and please forgive me, Pizinski. And uh, Morgan, if you could please give your name and your residence if you are over 18. If not, um, if you could just tell us the city, that would be that. That's fine. Hi, I'm Morgan Pazinski. I live in Bangor. All right. So as I said, my name is Morgan Pazinski. I'm a rising senior at Bangor High School. Senior year is an important part of an adolescent's life, typically coinciding with the senior's 18th birthday, the trademark of adulthood and adult rights, such as voting. It's important to understand the value of the voice, which comes in the form of a vote many times. Each year we see not as many young people taking opportunities to vote, despite three out of four Americans aged 18 through 29 saying that they had a genuine interest in politics and elections, according to the American National Election Studies and corroborated by the journal The Conversation. In 2016, only 43% of eligible voters showed up to vote in the 18 through 29 years of age demographic and that year, as we all remember, was a high stakes presidential election year. A way that this has been proven to improve voter it, turnout is to remove obstacles to voting that often come in the form of not knowing how to vote and register, where the voting sites are, as well as how voting works in college, where you might not be voting in your hometown or even your home state, along with many other issues. One form to remove these obstacles would be the school-led initiatives, which we are proposing in our demands. In a study conducted by professors John B. Holenbein and D. Sunshine Hilligus of the University of Virginia and Duke University, respectfully, they have found initiatives such as those proposed in our recommendations have worked such as one known as the Fast Track Program in North Carolina, which increased voter turnout for the un underprivileged youth in the area by 30%. With Fast Track, the focus group was the underprivileged youth, as stated before, who are most at risk, and through education and support that are quite similar to what we are asking for, the program saw great success. While this data is focused on those 18 and above, our initiative is about more than just those who will be 18 before elections. It impacts those who are 16 and older who can register, as well as the 17-year-olds who can vote in the primaries. It's important to guide individuals through this new responsibility that they are taking on with their coming of age. With that support from the schools responsible for introducing the youth to what it means to be an adult, it's setting up new adults for increased difficulty in navigating the voting process, which is why I must urge you to lend support to our movement and changes that should occur within the school par department, particularly within the high school should our recommendations be met. Thank you. Thank you very much, Morgan. We, we appreciate um, you speaking. Um, next, we have Wells Mundell Wood. Um, Wells, if you could just give us your name and your city of residence. Hi, uh, my name is Wells Mundellwood. I think most people know me. Um, I live in Bangor at 79 Norfolk Street. Um, yeah, as I said, I think everyone here knows me and my mom is probably a little bit surprised to see me here. Um, and I just wanted to quickly speak on behalf of Maine Youth Power and express my support for the initiatives that were just described. 
I think something that's really important, I also just graduated from Bangor High School. I forgot to say that I'm a um, upcoming college freshman. I think something that's really important to understand is that youth voices need to be amplified because we are more than just students trying to reach a certain GPA or get into a certain college. We are future voters and future decision makers and amplifying our voices through voter ed is pretty much a civic duty that falls on our educators. By instituting a more comprehensive voter education curriculum, Bangor can act as a leader and show the rest of the state that youth voices matter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wells. Um, and the last person that I have is um, Phoebe Dolan. Um, same, if you are underage, please don't give us your, um, your exact address, just your city of residence would be lovely. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, thank you. Wonderful. My name is Phoebe Dolan and I live at 105 Stevens Road in Swanville, Maine. Um, hello, com school committee. Um, as I said before, I'm Phoebe Dolan and I'm one of the co-directors of Maine Youth Power, this um, infamous organization, which many folks have mentioned. Um, I, we are an inclusive movement of young Mainers working in solidarity uh, for human dignity, access, equity, and a livable future um, by building power across Maine. I'm out east and I'm here working with the Bangor students because I met Jordan this past year and she and I and all the students speaking tonight have been working really hard to bring around the change that we need to see in voting education at Bangor. I've had the joy of being a resource to the student core as they've built out their list of demands and really, really stand alongside them as and encourage you all to support them. Bangor High School is the largest, if not one of the largest public high schools in Maine. And there, it turns out to be, turns out probably the most voting age young Mainers in the state. I care deeply about young people seeing Maine as a great place to live and to stay. Maine has the oldest population on average in the country and it's also aging. And that makes it very hard for young people to feel heard and valued, not only in who represents them, but just in general in the state. We know that the students speaking today, as well as myself, will inherit the amazing and challenging pieces of society that are currently being made. Therefore, making sure we are most equipped for success is incredibly important in who's in office. It is vital that Bangor High School listens and follows these demands as they are laid out by the students before you today. A half day off is important because it brings true equity to the tardiness and absence, leniency and whatnot, um, because it's important for all students to be able to access those types of um, forgivenesses during a election day and during voting season. I appreciate you for listening to the students today. And I know that um, we are bringing these demands to Bangor now because we know that you all have the potential to really lead the state um, as a school that has excellent voter education and access for all students. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you very, very much. Um, we have all heard you. And I know you mentioned that you've already met with Principal Butler. I understand that you've met with uh, Superintendent Tager. And we, um, we look forward to sort of looking at your demands and um, kind of looking to see where we might be able to fit something, how that may work within our school district and um, potentially talking with you later. So thank you all very, very much. Um, I'm not seeing any other public comments. So um, we're gonna move on to the superintendent proposals and updates. Um, oh, goodness gracious, I'm so sorry. Thank you, that's what that piece of paper was that I kept putting my sticky notes on. Um, uh, dear school committee, this is from Brian Pittman at 93 Grant Street. I'm writing to you today to ask you and the superintendent um, move to keep the $500,000 that you have been asked to return to the city of Bangor for property tax relief. This money will be much needed by the schools during this very difficult upcoming year as we continue to work our way out of the pandemic. Giving this pandemic is ongoing, this money would be useful in addressing any staff shortages, immediate changes as a consequence of the pandemic, or other unexpected issues that may arise. School funding should be kept for the schools. Thank you for your time, consideration, and hard work during these very difficult times. 
Thank you very much for that, Brian. I think that we are going to be talking about this particular issue here in just a few minutes. Um, thank you. Uh, so superintendent proposals and updates. Action items. Uh, please know that I'm helping Mr. Tager um, transition here. So that's why I'm talking. Um, he'll, he'll be in the seat fully next to him. So um, Superintendent Tager will provide you with an overview of the FY22 budget revisions. Th thank you, Kathy. And first of all, I want to state what a lot of others have already stated. Um, I thank Kathy for serving as interim superintendent. Um, she's going to model the protocol for me tonight. I want to handle this particular item. Um, other than that, she's going to run us through the budget and I'm going to take some notes. Um, what I would want to thank Kathy for specifically is her communication and feedback to me has been very valuable. Uh, we've been able to work together in the month of May and June, and I just wanted to thank you publicly for your support, Kathy. Um, what I'm going to talk about is action item um, FY22 budget revisions, and it does involve the strategic goal areas of excellence, teaching and learning, engage relationships, safety and well-being. I'm going to spell this out for you and then, then take some questions from school committee members. Um, so I'm asking, I'm recommending that the committee approval of the FY22 budget revisions and it's item D1A. And I'm going to read the articles that will be changed um, due to the revision. We have some extra dollars that have come in to our budget. So we would like to make an adjustment I'm gonna read the articles that are going to be affected by this with change. But I, when we vote, I'm gonna ask you to vote on all 13 articles on my recommendation on the updated budget. So article one is to, is to see what sum the school administrative unit will be authorized to expend for regular instruction for the fiscal year 2021, 2022. We are recommending 22 million. $203,901. Article two will also change from the budget that you approved to see what sum the school administrative unit will be authorized to expend for special education for the fiscal year 2021-2022. We're recommending $9,849,851. If you look at Chair. article, yes, sir. Um, I believe we have to vote on each one of those individually. Okay. And we cannot take them as a group. So okay. I don't know if you want to take each one individually and ask questions or our first and second and then discussion, but they do need to take, be taken individually. Okay. Would it, would it be okay um, if I were to go through all of this and then come back and do them individually? We should do all of them and they have to vote that we do this and then we have to Okay. Question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Member Caruso. So um, I need a motion to open up the discussion of the entire, the, the budget conversation. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. And then, um, so now we'll discuss and-, and no, you, no. Got a, you got a vote to open it up first. Okay, so 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 we're going to vote to open it up. So Superintendent Tager is recommending approval of the FY22 budget revisions. We'll need to vote on each article, what we need to vote to start the process. Okay, so we've got a second. Um, and all those in favor and- no. Discussion. And we have to do a roll call vote because right. you have people that are- Yes, we have to do a roll call vote because of um, the Zoom members, so. So Member Caruso. I have a question. Do we have a discussion? Oh, yeah. That, you have, we're, we're, we're just voting to open up this conversation about the budget. But, but I have a question about that. It's debatable. Yeah, I, I have a question why we're voting to have a discussion. We typically, when we're presenting something, we vote that this is what his recommendation is, and then there'd be open for discussion, and then we would vote for each article. But if you don't feel that we need to vote to approve the budget, then we could just do each one individually. And so I guess my question is, is there a discussion that needs to be had on the overall budget and why can't it be had on each article as it goes? Because to me, it seems as though that's what should happen. Okay. The first article should be read, first and second discussed, and then voted on and go on down through that way. Unless there's an overarching issue with the overall budget 
Each article should be taken individually like we normally would. Each article should be discussed individually if there's discussion for any article. That's standard procedure. Yeah. Uh, Member I Mundell. I, I do have a question about that. So if, if we were to say approve article one, but then not approve a subsequent article, wouldn't that affect the amount of money in the other articles? I mean, this 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 is my first rodeo. Yes, with this. Well, not <laughs> so that so if we, uh, I have another question too. If we are are we voting to hold the vote, or is there a dis can there be a discussion about whether or not to hold the vote? Because I know, I know I have a ton of questions, and I think other people do as well. Superintendent Tager wanted to go over all of the changes that he was making um, before we went through each article, but. Okay, yeah, I, I, I would recommend that he, he offer those so we have a better understanding so when we take the vote, but I don't think we need to vote in order for him to do that. That would be my experience and knowledge that voting for him to give us the information, I, I don't think that's necessary. He can make that as a part of, before we go each one individually, discuss it overall, but each one's going to need to be voted on separately. So I'm gonna make sure that I've got this correct. So you would like me to go ahead and go through my discussion and then come back and go through each article. Is that correct? Yes. It doesn't necessarily need, you don't need to read each article. Okay. You can discuss it, you know, overall. as a whole, overall, if there's particular topics on each one, and then, then each one would be read in and then voted on. Okay, so I can go through my discussion first, take questions, and then we'll go through each article. That's my recommendation based on my experience. Okay. Yes, and that, that was my my understanding of it as well, so. Madam Chair, so will, will, will members have a, uh, will we have a chance to voice our, our concerns and our objections to um, the, the budget? Like for instance, um, some members might be opposed to transferring half a million dollars to the city. Yes. Are we gonna have that chance to, to Yes, speak? so I think okay. what we're gonna do now is we've made a motion for a first and a second and we're in the discussion, which is to talk about the budget and to give um, Superintendent Tager an opportunity to kind of give us that that overarching and then we will vote on each individual one. So we will have an opportunity to ask questions based on sort of that that overview. So we're not doing what member Mundell was worried about, which is voting on something and then having to go back and change it if we don't vote for it. Member Mundell. So if if is, is there an option, and I apologize, this is my first time doing this, so I don't know how thing, how this works, but is there an option if we feel like we're not ready to vote um, to postpone the vote if we if, if the discussion doesn't lead us to all the elucidation? That... Abstain, you may abstain, yeah. no votes, unfortunately. Okay, I guess, I guess I have a question. Do we have to vote on this now? Like, is there, is there, we do, based on, Either it's the only way we're going to get the money. Get it. If we don't vote on it, we don't get it. Correct. Okay, that's helpful. And, and I think the, the whole point of this discussion now is so that Superintendent Tager can go through and answer all of our questions. Okay, thank so you. So I think we've had our first and our second. So please, and thank you, Member Caruso, for, for that. And I just back up. I think we should withdraw the first and second because we're not ultimately going to vote for him to discuss it. It's just going to be part of the presentation of the budget. So, and that we've done this before. He's recommended the approval of the budget, but each one has to be voted individually. So our vote, I don't know what that vote carries, gives him the right to speak. He has the right to speak already. <laughs> so should I withdraw, would, would the point of, proper point of order be to withdraw my? I, I think I think either that or make. I then I withdraw my my first on the, on the, the first, the motion I made, I withdraw that motion. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and present, and then we'll, we'll go back through um, each of the articles. So I'm going to take you to um, Article 13 as part of my presentation, and it, I'm going to walk you through just to give you a full understanding before you make a decision as, as a school committee. Um, Article 13, I'm just going to touch upon that. If you'll take a look at that, it says the Bangor School Department has received, which is a, which is a good thing, more state education subsidy than the amount included in its budget. The school committee is, is authorized to 
first use 500,000 of the additional state subsidy to decrease the local cost share expectation as defined in Title 20-A, Section 15671-A1B. For local property taxpayers for funding public education, the school committee is then authorized to use $313,665 for extra staffing, which I'm gonna go over in detail, the school committee is then authorized to transfer to the city the remaining amount of $862,901 to the Bangor School Department Capital Reserve Fund, which would eliminate the need for bonding. So what I'm gonna do is, is go ahead and do my discussion and then take, take questions. The part that I wanna to talk to you about is four um, proposed personnel additions. And one of them would be a district wide social worker which is in the area of social emotional learning, which is a concern as we bring students back for in-person learning, and that is one FTE. We're also talking about a 0.5 FTE pre-kindergarten teacher for Vine Street School. Um, what that would allow us to do is meet one of our strategic five-year plans early. Um, we would be able to have a full-time pre-K unit at Vine Street. Um, Lynn will talk about this in a moment, but I think it's an excellent, excellent opportunity for students. It gets us ahead of where we want to be with our strategic plan. You've got a very experienced and dedicated educator so to, that could start this strategic plan initiative. And I think one of the things that we've all learned with students missing school, the importance of students to be back, and then the importance of pre-K will help the Bangor School Department immensely. So that's one thing that we're proposing. Another thing that we're proposing is a one FTE for Down East School for either a pre-K or a kindergarten teacher. And that is also one FTE. We're anticipating students coming back, which would predicate that need. We're not sure if it would be at the pre-K or the kindergarten level yet. We also expect a number of students to come back um, across the Bangor School Department. So we're asking for another point uh, one FTE for elementary based enrollment. So we don't know the school yet for a pre-K or a kindergarten teacher. So I want you to kind of have the idea that we're looking at pre-K, we're looking at kindergarten, we're looking at our first full day pre-K experience, and we're looking at a social worker, which we feel there is a need for that as well. So before I move on, and that's a 3.5 FTE total, I would like for Lynn to be able to talk a little bit about how this might, might be a valuable thing for her school. I'm so excited to be here tonight in person for the first time, I think in 15 or 16 months. Am I standing where I'm supposed to so you can hear? Everything's changed while I was out, <laughs> you redecorated. I am so, so excited to um, have the opportunity to speak to you a little bit tonight about something that I'm very passionate about, which is early childhood education. And so um, when um, I found out this might be a possibility, I got right into the research so I could bring you some a couple of things and I will keep it short. If you want to stay after, I'll stay as long as you want and talk as long as you want about this, but I will try to keep it short for tonight. Um, we do did set as a strategic goal by 2025 that we would have full-time pre-K in all of our schools. And it's so important because we know from the growing body of research that these early um, experiences in life can have huge implication on children as they begin their careers, their educational um, journeys in our schools. <clears throat> there are some, I have research. I was thinking Dr. Shrett would be here and I was going to hand it right to him, but I have some um, research that from some leading universities that started to work on this. This is relatively new across the country. So there's not a lot of long research or, or um, research for longevity, but the initial reports are very favorable that they are finding huge positive impacts on children with full day pre-K, including areas of receptive language, which is something that those of us who took the pre-K course um, with, the, with the Department of Education, that was like one of their big pieces they wanted us working on. Cognition, literacy, math, physical development, social emotional health, and school readiness skills. Um, I'm really excited it's Vine Street that got chosen. We were kind of um, in a sweet spot with our schedule and also with our free and reduced population being at 65%. 
The research is also clear that children in poverty are much more likely to struggle and not have access to early childhood educational experiences. And so the resources that these parents have are not the same as other people. Um, they don't have options to pay necessarily for full day pre-K. So us being able to offer this in our district is a huge benefit for us. Uh, we do know that the impact of poverty on children is substantial. There's a lot of research with that as well. And we know that some of our children um, are lacking some of those developmental skills that they need, exposure to things like nursery rhymes, which, bring, which help with phonemic awareness and exposure to books and having access to those things. By having it in our school, we would also be able to provide a free lunch and breakfast to every child. So that's two meals a day instead of one. And um, I have a, a highly qualified teacher in my building who's very interested in doing this. And we have um, a literacy coach um, for the majority of the time in our building who has been a leader in pre-K um, professional development. She and I have been leading this initiative in Bangor for six or seven years and doing that, that um, professional development. So if you have any other questions or if you would like to research, Dr. Sred, I will save you a copy. I actually had some questions on that data. I was gonna ask him, but he's <laughs> away. So do you want me to take any questions or come back later? We'll come back. Thank you, Principal Silk. Appreciate you, you being here. Next thing I wanna mention is we received a priority notice. It's called ED 279 reports updated for year 2022. It comes from the main DOE as a priority notice. And I just wanted to share this um, with the school committee as well. It says that the following one-time language was approved as a part of the budget to enable school boards to utilize additional funds appropriated after the majority of SAUs have approved budgets for FY 2022. The part that I thought might interest you is it says not withstanding any provision of the law to the contrary and for the fiscal year 2021, 2022 only, a school board of a school administrative unit that receives more state education subsidy than the amount included in the budget is authorized to use all or part of the additional subsidy to, and it mentions three specific things, increase expenditures for school purposes, increase the allocation of finances in a reserve fund approved by the school board, we had mentioned bonding as one of the things that we are interested in um, being able to cover that. And then the third thing, it says decrease the local cost share expectation as defined in section 15671-A subsection one, paragraph B, which I already mentioned for local property taxpayers as approved by the school board. So a couple other talking points and then we'll take some questions. So things I would like for you to consider as a school committee, um, the things that we're asking for in the revision um, do fit our strategic goals for excellence, teaching and learning, engage relationships and safety and well-being. Um, I mentioned the Article 13, which I think is key information. Um, I mentioned the proposed personnel that we're looking at with the attention to social emotional learning and our youngest learners, pre-K and kindergarten. And I just shared with you the ED 279 report that was updated and sent by the, as a priority from Maine DOE. Um, some of the things I've learned since taking this job, and, and I just want you to keep an open mind and give you all the information is the community certainly has assisted us during COVID um, in talking through different folks with technology. And when I went on my spring tour of all the schools, it was very evident that our community has been kind to us with different donations. And so I think that's one reason I'm asking you to consider this. Um, our collaboration with the, the city certainly is important. We'll be doing a budget with them um, next spring. So that's something that's on my mind. Another thing that I want you to think about is the average income in Bangor is three to 40,000. And we have a number of folks that are on a fixed income. And one thing that, that is on my mind is the rental effect. We have a number of folks that rent. And what happens is if we have the opportunity to decrease the local cost share expectation, um, as taxes go up, so do rents. And so that, that would affect um, a number of our students. And I am concerned about the 30 to 40 um, average income and folks that are on a fixed income. The other thing that attracted me to this job is 
Bangor School reputation is is excellent. We have a lot of bright spots. And you've talked to me about communication. We want to share all those things with the community. And I think this is just a, something for you to think about in your decision. Um, I mentioned at ED279. Another thing that I want you to think about to see the big picture is in August, we will start talking about um, ESSER 3 funding, which is COVID type of funding that we'll be receiving. Um, we'll start those conversations at our August board meeting. We have to get input from all of our stakeholders. So faculty, staff, students, families, the community, as to what can we spend that money on that will help us with specific things. And some of those things that we can spend the money on, and I'll go into great detail in August, um, we can spend it on the impact of lost instructional time. We can address mental health needs, social emotional learning, building safe and inclusive environments, HVAC and ventilation systems, I do want to point out that the ESSER dollars are not for um, salaries or bonuses. There are certain states that have already gotten in trouble for that. There's been a governor in one state that promised bonuses to all the teachers in the state, and now they've received a letter from the Fed saying that that's not what that money money is allocated for. But you know, we have some extra money come in tonight that you're going to make the decision on. But I want you to also know that um, we will receive ESSER funding for $12,937,000 that we will start talking about at our August meeting. And we uh, that money um, can be utilized through September of 2023. So we do have some additional dollars coming our way due to COVID. Um, Jerry and Kathy, are there any comments that, that you wanna make in this discussion that maybe I forgot or to give more clarity? I know we've had discussions before I brought this forward tonight, uh, and if not, we will take questions from the school committee. Jerry, or, or uh, anything you want to add that I failed just, to mention? Just one comment. I worked uh, with uh, Deb Laurie. So they can see you on the camera. <laughs> <laughs> I worked with Deb Laurie, uh, CFO for the city, to try to, to determine what the tax impact of 500000 really means, and it means $0.20 cents on the mill rate. So I wanted to have you take that in consideration. It's um, a little over $30 on a resident that's um, $175,000. She has a program that you can uh, put in the uh, extra money and it, it shows exactly what happens. So on a uh, dwelling, which is sort of on the low end, $175,000, uh, the tax rate would be over $30 and it's 20 cents on the mill rate. So it would take it down to uh, uh, $22 and 70 cents, I believe. That's an estimate. Don't put that in the paper. Um, uh, the, the official number would come from the city, but that's what I saw on the estimated documents. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you very much. And Dr. Harris, my good. And I would say it, when you see this money, you think it would be very good to add a lot of positions right now. But the thing is, we have to be very cautious about whether it would be developing a cliff at our next year, because the funding will go back to the original funding formula where we would have lost this amount. Um, so I do, we do have to be cautious in the amount of staffing that we have or add. Member Hyatt. Can we open up to, up to questions? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I, I've been kind of doing the math here. Um, this is 566566 that's that's coming in from the um, coming in from the state. Um, if we go with tonight's proposal, half a million dollars um, to the city, 313,665 to new positions, and we put 862,901 dollars towards bonding, we'd only be in, in a sense using 18%, 18.71% of this money tonight would be used. 81% of it, we would be putting to lower the tax rate or to borrow less money. Now, this school committee, when we did our budget, we did a good job. We did not raise taxes on people at all. Okay, we, we, did, we did not raise taxes this year. For the life of me, I don't understand why it's the school committee's job 
to do the council's job and lower in taxes, property taxes. I mean, we're, we have a lot of issues in Bangor. You know, I, I come from a very poor area. You know, a half a million dollars plus the $862,000 can go a lot of ways to helping a lot of families in Bangor. And I just, I can't imagine, we're talking $30 on homes that are worth $175,000. You know, and they say, well, we, we, we don't help people. People are going to, you know, it'll help it stop people from raising rents. Landlords are going to raise rents anyways. They're already doing it. I just, I think it would be when we, and, you know, as, as the county treasurer, I deal with millions and millions of dollars here. And so in the scheme of things, this is, this is not a lot. A half a million dollars will not go a long ways to lower our tax burden, but it sure as hell will go a long ways to help in the school department fight poverty. And that's through, you know, more social workers, more mental health professionals. Um, if it's maybe providing um, free meals, doing good social good for, for the broader community. And that's, that's what I think we should look at um, tonight. Again, the numbers that strike when, when I was sitting here doing the calculations, only 18.71% of the money we talking about spending tonight. The rest we're looking to put it towards lowering a bond and giving it to the city to help them lower taxes, even though we didn't raise anybody's taxes. We fought tooth and nail to keep everybody's taxes flat, but now we're doing the council's job to try to lower taxes. To me, that doesn't seem fair. Thank you, Member Hyatt. Um, Yes. Since we're the C of Caruso. Hey. Wow, <laughs> Member Caruso. Uh, so I have a I have a couple oh, questions. No. That the articles listed, the ones in yellow, are the ones that are going to be changed. The numbers are changing. Yes. And they're going up, associated with the three hundred eighteen thousand of the positions. Correct. Okay. Secondly, uh, w part of those three and a half positions, one of them is a social worker. That would be on top of the social worker that we added in the regular budget process. Correct? Correct. Okay. So we've addressed that need that was so critical when we discussed in the budget process. I have a question from a, um, I, I thought when we voted for the budget, we already included an article that if we got additional funds, X none of them, X amount of them would be returned to the city to lower taxes. That's a that's something that we've done year over year, and that we've generally done because we had to do it before the budget was voted on, so that it, we were covered when the budget was voted on and we got more money in July. Mm -hmm. And so Article 13 seems to be repetitive because we've already done this. We've already associated X number of dollars going towards back towards city relief, tax relief. And so I don't know why it's back in there. I, I could be mistaken. Maybe we didn't do it this year, but we've always had that provision in our practice in the past. Can anyone answer that question? We had the 13 articles and you'll see the wording is very similar or it is actually the same. So I guess where we've already voted on it, why are we voting again on it? You're voting on the articles because they have changed in the numbers that you would have to vote for. It, the money has been moved to different um, planes. Right. But the for. theory of returning money to lower taxes has already been voted on and approved. I can tell you through my, my research, and that's an excellent point that you make, Member Caruso, is looking through. I found that exact wording from a few years ago. So I think that it's something I thought it was been, included in this year's vote as well. business with the board. So I'm I not sure why we're debating whether we should return X number of dollars We've always determined that we return X number of dollars and then the others would be allocated accordingly. This, the article 13 matches the, the past history of this school committee. I can tell you that and through my research, you know, I've only started July 1st, but I was able to find that very easily. Didn't we vote on that already? Yes. So again, I ask the question, why are we revisiting it? Aside from the numbers, we've already approved that that's what we would do. Is that's what we approved we would do according to the amount given back to the city. That is correct. We already said we would give the city back up some to, of the money. Up to $500,000. Yes. And so then, I, I'm not sure why we would re-vote on that if we've already approved that. 
my understanding was that if you change the budget, then you have to do the whole budget, all, every article. Right. That's I, I just want to know that oh. that's what I understand. So uh, in that theory of things, I think it serves our purpose very well to return some tax money to the city because that tax money is a taxpayer's money anyway. <laughs> it came from the state. It's their money anyway. If $30 is $30, it's still the, the, the good practice of being a good community. Particularly with over here, we're getting $12 million from the federal government was almost 13. Almost 13 that we're going to be able to spend on whatever need we think we're going to have for the most part, mm -hmm. except adding more positions, which we shouldn't be doing with this extra funding anyway, because we're not going to have this extra funding going over the next three years. And it's only going to create a larger budget issue moving forward. So I am very much in favor of the what you're proposing. And the $890 to reduce the bond does save our money because eventually we're going to have to pay that back and we have a yearly payment for interest anyway. So it lowers our overall debt service. So that money comes back to us in a budget savings. So this is to me a very easy decision um, to be good stewards of, of our, our citizens money to return a little bit to them, I think only makes uh, and keeps that good relationship we have with the city city of Bangor and the, and the city councilors, as well as the citizens of Bangor, particularly those that don't have children in the school system that often wonder why. I'll add one more point. The mill rate goes a long way and reducing that by 20 cents goes a long way in when families look to move into areas and we're not one of the highest tax on the mill rate goes a long way to say, I might wanna live in that city. We've always been benefited by an outstanding school system, mm -hmm. which we continue to be. And, and so I think we'd, we'd be prudent to reduce that if we have that opportunity. So I'm in favor of these suggested changes. Mm -hmm. And I th think they make complete sense in, in the sense of where we're spending the money and why, and we're not creating a larger issue in the future by spending $800,000 on more new positions that in the future we may not be able to afford again. $13 million coming from the federal government. This is a small price to pay because we're going to have a, a large sum of money to be able to do some things that we want to do. I wanted to comment on that too. Thank you for your comment. Is That's why I mentioned too with the ESSER dollars or the COVID dollars, it's through September of 2023. So the, those are some possibilities of some potential jobs that would last a year or two because of the cliff, but we know that they would be temporary positions. But when you think about things like mentoring and things that students are going to need coming back after a year like no other, we do have some opportunities to kind of build on the great things that happen here. And those funds could be used for break education, right? They could. Summer education to help have that opportunity to catch up where we're not adding it into the budget where we know two years from now. Loss, yes. Right. Yep. So. Oh, I'm, yeah. Thank you, Member Caruso. <laughs> Brain gone. Uh, Member Sorg. Oh, thank you. You remembered it, Sorg. There you go. Yes. Um, I'm apt to agree with Member Caruso. This is my seventh year on the committee. And every year that we've gone through a budget, the money we got back from the state was given back to the city to support the tax rate, tax base. I mean, when you look at it, we live in Bangor, we are taxpayers. It goes to the city, it goes to the state. The state is giving some of our money back. In all fairness and all honesty, we need to give some money back to the people. I am one of these people in the community now that no longer has anybody in the system except my grandson who's in the high school. So therefore, when I get taxed, I am going to get my taxes higher as a apartment owner, I am going to be raising the rent to my tenants because either that or I'll have to file an abatement, which means a lot of people will be filing abatements with the city if the taxes go too high. Also, I agree with Member Caruso in the fact that when people look at the mill rate, and I know when we first came home to Maine, 1990, that's one of the things we did. We went through the real estate book and looked at the mill rates. Where are we going to live and who has the higher? We're not going to live there. The mill rate's too high. Taxes are too high. Also, I'd like to add last spring, we as a committee and Superintendent Webb went out to the community and asked for donations to help with our internet so that all our students would have web access to the internet and school services. 
I think it's time we said thank you very much and give a little back. And I just for clarification purposes, we're not saying that we're raising taxes. No. We're we're saying that we're trying to lower your taxes. So that that's a very different. So I just I just want for clarification. Uh, just Member one Mon quick one quick point on that though. Mm -hmm. If we keep the money, right, we're not we're not taking the opportunity to lower taxes. Correct. Right. Correct. If if we if we keep. Mm -hmm. If we keep the money, we're not taking an opportunity to lower taxes, but if we keep the money, we're not raising taxes. So, uh, Member Mundell? Yeah, I have a number of questions. Um, first of all, you, you said that this, this has been done before. It's um, kind of following precedent in Bangor. Um, I, I'm kind of at a loss as to why that would necessarily be precedent, although your comments have helped me somewhat. Um, is this something that you, done in other districts that you've been the superintendent of, or is this something different for you? Something new to me to receive money back from the state. Okay. And, so and, and, and <laughs> is, it, is it new? It's the other way around. Okay. So is it new for, 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 from your perspective for a school system to give money back to the city? Not from what I've seen as the past history here. So, but it's not, but from schools where you've been before, have you given money back I can't, to the cities? Um, even make that comparison because I've never been in a situation where we've received okay, more money than we've done our budget. Dr. Harrison, I can help. Um, there were some years ago there was called ARA funds, and the city did receive additional funds, and they did give some of it back to the city for tax abatement, okay. and that was very common statewide. Okay, so um, so the city is also receiving funds from the state. Is that correct? So is the city then going to give us some of that money back? I mean, I I, I I'm just at a loss for why um, a school board would want to give away money. I mean, I understand the need to to reduce property tax rates but do we what assurance do we have that when we give money to the city it's going to be used for that purpose for one one question it when we give it back to the city do they just have a blank check to use it however they want i mean how, how do we know that i mean you say no but how do we know that so if, if i can answer uh, as, as the practices it yes would, right. it, it would in theory take a half a million dollars we put it towards the budget um they would, they would, they would cut a half a million dollars off their budget and they would, they would use that money therefore in a sense it would, it would lower taxes it's it's the it's a cycle um you're, you're basically taking one set of money and you're, you're putting it towards um another purpose the, the money that we're getting from the state actually came from the federal government which borrowed the money so the federal government borrowed trillions of dollars, they sent it to the states, and I'll say the state just sent it. They sent it to us, and now we're going to send it over, looks like we're going to send it to the city. It just, it's a vicious cycle. It, it, it makes no sense. Um, yeah, I, I just know what we need to do now. Thank you, yeah, can I keep going mm -hmm. with my questions? Um, so I've talked with a number of city councilors who um, have expressed puzzlement about this as well because they want to support the schools. I mean, we all know what a toll COVID has taken on our students. Um, we passed a budget in June or whenever that was with the understanding that we we're getting new money. Um, and we passed a flat budget for that reason. Um, so I feel there's a little bit, um, you know, I, I would first of all like to see the language in that article that we've past supposedly that says we were to give money back to the city is it possible to find that because if we voted for it then i agree with member caruso that maybe we should you know then we've got to agree with this but and, and that has been pretty common language for the, for the past five years that i've noticed okay i think i i, I just want to be careful <laughs> we haven't had covid for the past decade and the needs are extraordinary. Um, I see it in my practice. I see kids who have fallen through the cracks um, because there aren't enough mental health professionals in the schools 
to keep an eye on them. Um, I'm really concerned about, you know, what their state of mind is going to be like when they come back. And I know, you, I know you share these concerns. Um, you know, we spend the money now, we're not going to be paying for, you know, um, you know, police, jails, you know, the city is going to benefit from a good education in our city as well. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, and one other question. So the, so this money is for one year. Is that right? It is. To, to, to be spent within one year. And the ESSER money is to be sent within in three. September of 2023. Okay. And um, you said no salaries and bonuses for the ESSER money. Can we hire people? We can, but we have to keep in mind that those would be temporary positions unless we find another way to keep those positions. Right. So when she talks about the cliff, we, we, there, there probably would be a need when we start hearing from our community for some positions, but it would be a temporary position and then it would be a temporary position for a second year. Right. So it's really two years in a month from now, basically. Okay, gotcha. That's helpful. So, um, I mean, I can think of one shot um, things that we need that, you know, a cliff would be fine if we did, you know, we still haven't done an equity audit, um, which I think is really unfortunate given, you know, that racism was on the front page of our newspaper over a year ago, and we still don't have an equity audit. We don't survey kids for their mental health needs or their health needs at the schools. Um, we could do a one-time mental health and learning needs assessment with, with that money. I just, there are so many things we can do and I just feel like it's such a lost opportunity. Um, so I, I, I agree with member Hyatt uh, on this one, so. Thank you. Um, and uh, um, Superintendent Tager, could you tell us what would we be doing with the 500,000 should we not give it to the city? Any thoughts on that, Jerry? Well, we could do a num uh, any number of things, but it, it is um, to avoid a cliff. We um, we talked extensively about hiring 3.5 FTEs, and we, with our the budget size that it is, we thought that was a reasonable number that we could um, absorb and not create a cliff where we would have to lay off people. But if we increase that FTE number um, even more, we're more susceptible to a cliff that we can't recover from because uh, what um, Kathy Harris Weber said earlier that the funding formula will change back. Um, and this is one-time funding. So whatever we spend it on, in my opinion, would um, have to be <coughs> smart to do one-time items. And that's exactly why we proposed so much money to go into the um, capital reserve fund. What it will do, if you recall, we did last year, we did $2.2 million. Two million of that was for the Bangor High electrical project. We uh, anticipate 700,000 of that total that was read earlier for the electrical project again. So that's a, it's a, a $2.7 million project that we wouldn't have to bond. We could simply self-fund. So think of all the interest over 10, 20 years that we no longer have to pay. So you mentioned some, some one-time things. We have uh, $12 million coming and mental health services is a, a line that was read earlier and a lot of what you talked about were mental health um, needs. And they could, if it was voted on and agreed upon, fit nicely under that category. So if you don't give it to the city, think about one-time projects so you don't create a physical cliff going forward. That would be my advice. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, Member Hyatt. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I could think of one-time things we could um, we could perhaps spend it on. I mean, back back to school items for for, for our poor poorer families. Um, perhaps um, 
um, the, the extra money can't go towards employee bonuses, but we could use this towards, I mean, it's been a rough year on our staff, em employee bonuses. There's different things that we could, we could use this for. Um, I just, I just, the reason why the language was there in regards to giving tax dollars back to the city lower tax burden because the school department had a history of causing tax increases. We didn't cause tax increase this year. Just for the record, over 13 years, the tax increase has been less than 1%. So if you're gonna make statements, make sure they're accurate. We've never been a burden on the taxes for the last 12 years, 13 now. Okay, Okay. so again, but we, we still have been responsible for tax increases. It doesn't matter if it's 1% or 10%. We, I'm not saying we're a burden, I'm just, I'm just stating facts. I mean, you say to 1%, yes, 1% is, is, is it's not a large figure. Well, when you're dealing with millions of dollars, it is. But what I was, I was saying in general, this time around, this year, for the first time in many years, we didn't raise anybody's taxes. So I don't understand why we have the obligation to solve a city issue by lowering city taxes. When we, when we, we have so much and many needs that are, that are going on in the community. I, 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 I have a feeling that we got together, we could, we could take this money and, um, and, and, and do good for the community. And I'd be even fine of taking the entire amount of money to pay down debt service. It just, it just seems wrong to be giving it back to the city when it should be going to the school department. And I can understand if we, if, if we, if we were causing a tax increase this year by doing it, but this year we didn't raise anybody's taxes. Thank you, member Hyatt. Um, member, um, see, look, my, my brain, uh, member Hassanen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and hi everyone. I hope you can see me well. Um, so I have to agree with member Hyatt and member Mundell on this. Um, I was very concerned when I read that and I don't recall, uh, voting on this, uh, prior to this and, and reading this language. Um, and my concern is, you know, hearing even city councilors saying we, we don't need this money. The schools and our students need this money a lot more than we do. That's a, that's a red flag for me when, when our own city councilors are saying this. And there were several of them who have stated that. So, um, you know, and even if we've done it in the past, it's unprecedented, a very unprecedented year. There are many one-time projects that we can use it for. Um, and I can name several as well that we can use for DEI that we, tr we truly need. Um, so I, again, I'm very, very concerned about giving money away, um, especially this year. Thank you very much, Member Hassan. <laughs> um, I, I have a, a couple of questions, um, um, uh, Superintendent Tager. Uh, uh, Member Hyatt said we could use this money for employee bonuses. Is that accurate? Jerry. Okay. So, so um, would, would you mind um, coming closer and so that everybody knows with quite clarification, because I, I believe that there are some school districts in our area that have used some URSA funds for bonuses. And I've been told that that's a very dangerous and that they are going to have some problems. So I just want to make sure that the community knows with complete clarity that none of this money can be used for employee bonuses. It cannot be used for a straight up bonus. Okay. What I've heard, I'm not part of another town, but what I've heard, the extra funding given to employees was the result of extra work um, specifically outlined due to COVID. So it was something above and beyond normal duties. But I, like I said, I, I don't sit on another town. <laughs> so it wasn't so much a bonus. It was more the lines of a stipend almost. That's what I've heard. OK. okay. Hazard? Was like, would it be like, would that be a hazard bonus or a hazard, a hazard stipend? It was for work performed. So um, it would be like a stipend. So correct me if I'm wrong, but it's similar to what we did in which we had asked um, some of the teachers to potentially do some um, IT type classroom programs and they were paid a stipend in order to, to do that. It was it was paid for extra work. Correct. Stipends are quite common in the, in the, the uh, school budget uh, for all kinds of work. And right. I'm told that was 
along that lines with COVID. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for clarifying that. We just want to make sure we we have that. And then um, the next question that I had, um, uh, the, the debt service. So um, are we allowed to use uh, URSA funds for debt service? No. Okay. So no. <laughs> so we are not allowed to use the URSA funds for that. So we're looking at this extra state money to be able to to put toward debt service in order to be able to assist us to, to do to plan accordingly. That it's it feels almost as if there's some extra funds here that is lovely, but we have this extra funds coming and we're trying to plan accordingly to do the things that we need to do that we can't do with the URSA funds. Is that a Fair assessment. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I guess got one clarification. Yes. It's Member not, Caruso. It's not reducing debt service. It's reducing the amount we'd have to borrow. So I just want to clarify okay. that there's a bit of a difference there, right? That we're not reducing our debt. Correct. We're, we're using it for a project we've already slated that we won't have to borrow additional money. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. And what project? We left open projects last year. Okay. Yeah. Which is a million dollars is that i remember it was like crazy expensive the electrical project is 2.7 million Ooh. and a small piece that will go in the bucket that we're um, reserving for the bangor high school roof that you folks have yeah. heard about before and that's a 3.8 million dollar project that's the project we received a million dollars from the revolving loan fund correct so it took a million off the top but there's still if you authorize this, it'd still be 2.5 million that we would either have to fund ourselves or borrow in the future to complete that project. Okay, excellent. So from, from what I'm understanding, a lot of the one-time projects that have been mentioned by um, Member Mundell and Hyatt um, and Member Hassanen, a lot of 100% of those particular projects are projects that we could use the ESSER funds for? Outside of bonuses. Well, correct. Outside of bonuses, which are not allowed. Yep. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Um, Member Hyatt, but I'm going to ask um, if you not repeat anything that you've said earlier. Okay. I, I just have a... Sure. Sure. Fantastic. Um, can can the, instead of the half a million dollars going towards the city, can we just take that money and put it in the pig? And hold on to it and and do a wait and see approach to see if there's expenses that come up it, it, instead of getting i mean it, to me can we can we hold on to it is is there anything wrong with that i'm, I'm just i'm believe trying it, to think. believe it has to go to a reserve fund like the capital reserve fund where the other money's going is there any other funds we have like, uh, not that i know of and we are limited on the amount of money that we are able to carry over um, would be penalized even more with our allocations if we carried more than what the state would allow. The carryover is usually a million or two. I can't remember if it's a million or two fifty. Jerry, it's three percent. Three percent. So roughly one point five million. Is it is it a percent of of, of all the budget? What is that three percent? How does that how does that compare to other jurisdictions? Do you have a sense of whether that's high or low or the the uh, three three percent is determined by the state, um, so everybody is subject to that cannot exceed it for an unrestricted reserve is what I believe the um, councilman was talking about. So we um, usually keep. A couple million dollars in that and every year if you recall part of the budget we dedicate 1.25 million dollars of that to um, in essence not require tax um, ta tax payments from the the city of Bangor to uh, make the budget and then we um, replenish it the next year and rinse and repeat so every year and recent memory 1.25 million of unrestricted earnings has always been part of our budget that you've voted on. So it's most of the 1.5 that we could actually reserve. Okay. Thank you. Member Mundell. 
Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, so, the, so I'm sorry to bug you about this. It's um, confusing to me. So, so our limit for carryover is 3%. Is that right? That's as far as we can go is 3%. Okay. And we are at what now? Like 2% or? Well, we, yes, in that 2% range, 2.5% range, yes. And we, uh, like I said, we use 1.25 million. Um, what we're talking about today is to basically transfer the money to the city for a capital reserve, um, which is allowed under state law. Um, and you have to vote on it. And now if we, if you do vote on it, the city council would actually have to vote on it to basically accept it and add it to our reserve. And then when you, we choose to spend it and the, say the um, electrical project gets going in the next six months, you'd have to allocate some money to spend it. Um, you would have to say the expenditures for the next six months are projected to be half a million dollars. So you would vote to allocate a half a million dollars out of that reserve, which basically moves it to the checking account um, and the city would actually have to vote on the same thing. So there's a multi-step process to tap into a, re, a capital reserve. Okay, so you're referring to the amount of money, the 800 some thousand, right? That's correct. Okay. That's two types of reserves that we can have. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Um, I, I just want to mention um, my husband um, works in New Hampshire. Um, and he happened to see an article in the Concord Monitor, I think it is, he lives in Concord, um, about, um, about their, um, their uh, approaches to working with kids with mental health problems. They have a psychologist in every school, every school. <laughs> it, 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 we don't have, even have a full-time psychologist, or no, we have like one, 1. 1.2 or something um, on contract. So um, I understand about the cliff and the fact that in two years, we're gonna have to make some more hard decisions. Um, but, you know, uh, I majored in economics, strangely enough. And I know that when, you're, when the economy is hurting and we can look at our school system as hurting, um, you spend money, you don't save money during those times. Um, and I think this is a time that we need to spend some money, so. Thank you. Yes, Member Hassanen. And I also would like to get some clarification um, that this is not man mandatory, correct? This is not a mandate for us to give back money um, for one. And then two, you know, I understand the, the goodwill part, but again, with, you know, we don't know what needs will arise um, during the year. Uh, and I worry so much about that. Um, and I understand the, the federal money that's coming in, but again, you know, I get confused about how it can be spent and, you know, um, in terms of bonuses and staffing and so forth. So what if something happens during the year, things happen all the time and that we need that half a million so what do we do at that point? And we can't use the federal money, for example. One of the things, sorry about that. One of the things I could tell you is give you the specifics to give you an idea on what we could use the federal money for, which may, may help a little bit. I have a, a laundry list here and I gave you some of the um, items, but I can tell you exactly what the money could be spent on. It's coordinating preparedness and response efforts with state, local, tribal, and territorial public health departments to prevent, prepare for, and respond to COVID-19, training and professional development, um, purchasing supplies to sanitize and clean schools, uh, repairing and improving school facilities um, to reduce the risk of the virus transmission and exposure to en environmental health hazards, improve indoor air quality, addressing the needs of children from low-income families, children with disabilities, English learners, racial and ethnic minorities, students experiencing homelessness and foster care youth, developing and implementing procedures and systems to improve preparedness and response efforts, 
planning for and implementing activities during long-term closures, providing meals to eligible students, and providing technology for online learning, purchasing additional technology, providing mental health services and supports, planning and implementing activities related to summer learning and supplemental after school programs, addressing learning loss and other activities that are necessary to maintain the operation of and continuity of services, including continuing to employ existing or hiring new school staff. So that's very wide ranging what we can do with the COVID dollars, the ESSER, yes, S-E-R funds that are coming in, and that is 12.9 million. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I believe um, Kathy Conalo has her hand up. Chair Sictors. So our time for public comments has passed. Um, sadly, I apologize, uh, Kathy um, Conlo, um, but we we as a committee, even just a couple of months ago, had a conversation about this. Um, and that we wouldn't be accepting any additional comments during the meeting outside of the public comments time. So I, I apologize because I'm sure you could you could add something really uh, interesting to this. Um, I saw member Hyatt's. So I, I just I just have a, a question about tonight's vote. So if, if we if we if we vote against these articles tonight, we would we come back a second time to decide. I'm just I'm just curious. How do we how do we keep the five hundred thousand dollars? How do, do we just vote against certain articles? Do we have to vote for some? I'm just I'm just curious how 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 we can vote tonight to keep um, this money. And would we? Yeah. I, I believe we're. Go ahead, Dr. Harris Smith. Go ahead. <laughs> so if you vote it down, it doesn't necessarily mean that you get the money. It means that you voted it down, and then uh, Superintendent Tager would have to have another proposal. But each item is going to be voted on individually. So we, we could potentially vote to accept money, but we would, if that got voted down, then Superintendent Tager would go through and the redo of the 500000 but we'd have to vote the entire articles again because it would be a brand new budget. And to clarify, um, because I love pre-K, <laughs> I worry that that's in the same article. Um, would you then, if we did vote it down, would you then be able to take that out as a separate article and have us vote separately? So you would have to just rewrite that whole article. Okay. Dr. Smedberg, did you get an answer to our question about our vote in the spring? Didn't. We did not do Article 13 in the spring. I'm sorry. We did not. No. Nope. So again, just for clarification, Chair, um, what are if, if we want to keep the five hundred thousand dollars and sent and kick it back to our new superintendent, would we just vote Article 13 down? Article 12. I'm just curious. Upon, I guess a point of information. I mean, I know Warren would know. He's been the thing is, if you time. vote any of the articles down, then you automatically don't have a balanced budget, and you have to present a balanced budget. Okay, I think we are ready. Um, One more question. Yes, Member Caruso. If this was voted down, do we have a timetable in which we have to pass in order to receive the funding that we've been given? I mean, normally <laughs> there's always a timetable in order to get state money. So I gotta believe there's some sort of timetable. Now you did read the piece that allowed us some more flexibility. So I just wanna make sure we're not up against a time crunch. Off the top of my head, I don't know what that date is. Um, I'll find out. Because we don't have another meeting until August something, late August, right? Um, and I'm looking at Jerry and it doesn't look like he knows the date either. <laughs> or maybe he does. Um, Part of the ED-279 that was referred to earlier, where they state how much state funding you're going to get, the last page shows equal payments every month for the amount that they're going to appropriate. So the funding payments would start July, August, September. We get the money regardless of what we decide to do with it or what we tell them we're going to do with it. 
That's what it sounds like. That's, I, <laughs> that, that's the way it appears. Okay. Yes. Good. I just, again, wanted to know. I would caution more. that we look at law, though, to make sure. Yes, that, yeah. Have we gotten uh, the July payment yet? Yeah, because sometimes what's happened, the, the state has then said, you will not receive your last payment. Right. Um, and that has happened also. <laughs> and that's worse. <laughs> it's amazing the state just changes like things like that. Yes. Shocking. And um, uh, yes, Member Hassanen? Yes. Um, so Kathy has um, stated that she wanted to offer background on the budget process and not commentary on how to spend it. She says, I can help you with the process. Time crunch is commitment. And I think, I, I really think we should listen to her because she may help us kind of, you know, with more clarity. So that, well, you know, why is it that I keep getting all of these once in a lifetime things that happen to me? I mean, I can't even remember my committee's names right now. Um, I, 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 I would say that would be, it'd be kind of out of order. I mean, um, she's not a member of this committee. She's not a member of the school department. I mean, I'd love to hear from her. I just, I'm just yeah. thinking of, I, I don't yeah, and I, I think I think we we swore um, that we wouldn't break up the a precedent again. So I am so grateful to you, um, but we're going to um, hopefully harass you for those uh, for those answers on another occasion. But thank you very much for offering that. Um, I have one one final question: the URSA funds. When do we anticipate being able to discuss the use of those? We're gonna start that conversation at our August board meeting. We also have to survey uh, widely to get information. So we'll be surveying students, faculty, staff, and community. And it does not become a board decision as far as right. what that money is spending on, but it, the board will be informed and we do have to search for all stakeholders to get their opinions. And is are those surveys going to be starting Probably right about the first week of school. We'll, we'll have to have our plan in by probably mid-September. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So I think we're ready to uh, move to a vote on this. Um, and it's. I'm going to let you all take over the complicated f formula here. Do you want to read each article? Then? Sure. Okay. And then I'll call roll call. Yep. Okay. Article 1 to see what sum the school administrative unit will be authorized to expend for regular instruction for the fiscal year 2021-2022. And we are recommending $22,203,901. So moved. Second. Member Caruso. Yes. Do we have discussion? Oh. There's supposed to be a discussion after a first and second. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So if we um, if we vote yes on this and then vote no on thirteen, what happens? What we start all over at the next meeting? Yep. Okay. And I didn't hear the answer. <laughs> Sorry. It we would start all over at the next meeting. Okay. If we vote no on any one of these items. Okay. Okay. I do believe that the city is, is under a time crunch as far as if they are to receive funds and have it for tax um, relief. I may, that may be one of the things Kathy was going to say that if we wait, I think until the August meeting, they would not have that opportunity. So, okay. All right, Member Caruso. Yes. Member Hassanen. Yes. Member Hyatt. Yes. Member Mundell. Yes. Member Sword. Yes. Member Surratt? Yes. Member Sichters? Yes. Article two, to see what sum the school administrative unit will be authorized to expend for special education for the fiscal year 2021-2022, recommendation is $9,849,851. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? Seeing none. Dr. Harris Medberg? Member Caruso? Yes. Member Hassanen? Yes. Member Hyatt? Yes. Member Mundell? Yes. Member Sorg? Yes. Member Surratt? Yes. Member Sichters? Yes. Article three, to see what sum the school administrative unit will be authorized to expend for other instruction for the fiscal year 2021-2022. So moved. 
Um, let me I recommend the amount, $1,399,076. Moved. Second. Discussion? Dr. harris Medberg. Member Caruso? Yes. Member Hassanen? Yes. Member Hyatt? Yes. Member Mundell? Yes. Member Soar? Yes. Member Surrett? Yes. Member Sichters? Yes. Article four, to see what sum the school administrative unit will be authorized to expend for student and staff support for the fiscal year 2021-2022, recommend $4,423,364. So moved. Second. Dr. Oh, discussion? Dr. harris Medberg. Member Caruso? Yes. Member Hassanen? Yes. Member Hyatt? Yes. Member Mundell? Yes. Member Sword? Yes. Member Surratt? Yes. Member Sichters? Yes. Article 5, to see what sum the school administrative unit will be authorized to expend for system administration for the fiscal year 2021-2022, recommending $1,323,526. So moved. Thank you. Discussion? Doctor? Member Caruso? Yes. Member Hassanen? Yes. Member Hyatt? Yes. Member Mundell? Yes. Member Sword? Yes. Member Surratt? Oh. Yes, sorry. Okay. Member Sichters? Yes. Article 6, to see what sum the school administrative unit will be authorized to expend for school administration for the fiscal year 2021-2022, we're recommending two million six hundred ninety-six thousand seven hundred fifty-eight dollars. So moved. Second. Discussion. Member Caruso. Yes. Member Hassanen. Yes. Member Hyatt. Yes. Member Mundell. Yes. Member Soar. Yes. Member Surratt. Yes. Member Sichters. Yes. Article seven, to see what sum the school administrative unit will be authorized to expend for transportation and buses for the fiscal year 2021-2022, recommending $2 million. So moved. Second. Right. Discussion? Doctor? Member Caruso. Yes. Member Hassanen. Yes. Member Hyatt. Yes. Member Mundell. Yes. Member Sorg. Yes. Member Surratt. <laughs> yes. Member Sichters. Yes. Article 8, to see what sum the school administrative unit will be authorized to expend for facilities maintenance for fiscal year 2021-2022, recommending $6,100,104. So moved. Second. Discussion? Yes. I have a Number question percent. on Article 8. Um, is this where the $8.7 million went in, so $875,000 went into? Correct. Thank you. Dr. harris -Mendrick? Member Caruso. Yes. Member Hassanen. Yes. Member Hyatt. Yes. Member Mundell. Yes. Member Sorg. Yes. Member Surratt. Yes. Member Sichters. Yes. Article 9, to see what sum the school administrative unit will be authorized to expend for debt, ser debt service and other commitments for the fiscal year 2021-2022, recommending $1,553,200. So moved. Second. Discussion? Member Caruso? Yes. Member Hassanen? Yes. Member Hyatt? Yes. Member Mundell? Yes. Member Sword? Yes. Member Surratt? Yes. Member Sichters? Yes. Article 10, to see what sum the school administrative unit will be authorized to expend for all other expenditures for fiscal year 2021-22, Recommend $80,359. So, so moved. Second. Discussion? Seeing none. Member Caruso? Yes. Member Hassanen? Yes. Member Hyatt? Yes. Member Vandell? Yes. Member Sorg? Yes. Member Surratt? Yes. Member Sichters? Yes. Article 11, to see what sum the district unit will appropriate for total cost of funding publication, public education for kindergarten to grade 12, as described in the Essential Programs and Services Funding Act, recommend $51,630,139. So moved. Second. Discussion? Seeing none. Member Caruso? Yes. Member Hassanen? Yes. Member Hyatt? Yes. Member Mundell? Yes. Member Sword? Yes. Member Surratt? 
Yes. Member Sichters. Yes. Article 12, to see if the school administrative unit will authorize $549,251 for adult education and raise $200,000 as the local share with authorization to expend any additional incidental or miscellaneous receipts in the interest and for the well-being of adult education program. So moved. Second. Discussion? Dr. harris -Mudrick? Member Caruso? Yes. Member Hassanen? Yes. Member Hyatt? Yes. Member Mundell? Yes. Member Sorg? Yes. Member Surrett? Yes. Member Sichters? Yes. Article 13, the Bangor School Department has received more state education subsidy than the amount included in its budget. The school committee is authorized to first use 500,000 of the additional state subsidy to increase, to decrease the local cost share expectation as defined in Title 20-A, Section 15671-A1B for local property tax payers for funding public education. The school committee is then authorized to use $313,665 for extra staffing. The school committee is then authorized to transfer to the city the remaining, of, remaining amount of $862,901 to the Bangor School Department Capital Reserve Fund, which would eliminate the need for bonding. So moved. Second. Discussion. Yes, Member Hyatt. Yes, um, on Article 13, I would I urge my fellow school committee members to vote no on it. I think it is wrong that, you know, of the one point, the one million six hundred seventy six thousand five hundred sixty six dollars we're receiving, we're only looking to spend eighteen point seven one percent. You know, we can do better for our students, and you know, I I just strongly believe um, that we need to use this money. Um, for the betterment of our students. Thank you. Thank you, Member Hyatt. Member Mundell? Yes, um, I agree with Member Hyatt. Um, and um, I urge my fellow members to vote um, to keep the school funding at the schools. Dr. Harris-Medberg. Member Caruso. Yes. Member Hassanen. No. Member Hyatt. No. Member Mundell. No. Member Sorg. Yes. Member Surratt. Yes. Member Sichters. Yes. Motion passes. Um, uh, information items. I'm reporting the following reassignments for the 2021-2022 school year. Jessica Gallant from Social Worker in the Traces Program District Wide to Social Worker at the Bangor Regional Program. Sherry Thompson from Social Worker at Bangor Regional Program to Social Worker in the Choices Program District Wide. Thank you. Um, business action items. I'm reporting the following resignations from the 2020 2021 school year. Jamie Redding, grade four teacher, Fairmount School. And I believe I need a motion for that. No, no. you just get a motion. Oh, because oh, I forgot. Okay. Resignations. Yeah. Um, Business action items. Um, Superintendent Tager is recommending approval of the draft minutes of the June 23rd, 2021 regular school committee meeting. I need a motion. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, Dr. harris -Mudberg. Member Caruso. Abstain. Wasn't present. Member Hassanen. Yes. Member Hyatt. Yes. Member Mundell. Yes. Member Sorg. Yes. Member Surratt. Yes. Member Sichters. Yes. Um, and we have a financial report. Superintendent Tager is recommending approval of the May financial report. So moved. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, Dr. harris -Mudberg. Member Caruso? Yes. Member Hassanen? Yes. Member Hyatt? Yes. Member Mundell? Yes. Member Sorg? Yes. Member Surratt? Yes. Member Sichters? Yes. Um, uh, personnel? Nominations. Superintendent Tager is recommending the following teacher nominations for the 2021-2022 school year with a one-year probationary contract. Ryan Missler, history teacher at Bangor High School, and Mark Quinn, health physical education teacher at Bangor High School. Motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. 
Seeing none, Dr. Harris Mudburton. Member Caruso? Yes. Member Hassanen? Yes. Member Hyatt? Yes. Member Mundell? Yes. Member Sorg? Yes. Member Surratt? Yes. Member Sichters? Yes. Uh, do we have any extra duty assignments? We do. Superintendent Tager is recommending school committee approval of the following extra duty assignments for the 2021-2022 school year. Danielle Williams, uh, A, cheering coach at the James F. Dowdy School. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay. Member Caruso? Yes. Member Hassanen? Yes. Member Hyatt? Yes. Member Mundell? Yes. Member Sorg? Yes. Member Surratt? Yes. Member Sickers? Yes. Uh, any introduction items? Uh, can we maybe updates, don't we have? Oh, no. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Uh, committee updates. Do we have any comments? Yeah, okay. or oh, sorry, yes. Did we do the corporate authorization resolution for Barber Bank and Trust? In the pack and it's on the agenda. Hmm. It's not which agenda do I have? Do you have? Oh, we didn't have the most recommend. Okay. I guess I have an old one. Oh, the, this is the revised policy. All right. I didn't have the first okay. reading of the policies. All right. I'm sorry. I apologize. I had the wrong agenda. Hatch member Hyatt. Um, Just so a point of, it, it was a revised agenda, correct? Yes. yes. Did we vote on the revised agenda before we started? Um, no, we, didn't. No, we no. didn't. We did adjustments to the agenda and we didn't have that one. So I'm not sure we can, I'm not sure we can proceed with it. I, I don't know that, but I, I don't believe that it wasn't voted on. Correct. As an adjustment. I don't, I don't know. I'm just bringing it to, to our attention. Um, this is a revised. What do you guys think? It was sent out was, to you prior um, today. Right, but we didn't have vote on the adjustments to the agenda. We did not. So then we could not vote on it. I do not believe we can vote on it. Okay. Then we will um, vote on that next time. Could And could I, because I didn't have their correct agenda, which I apologize for, there are two other um, resignations for the school year. Could I share those or? I don't think. No, I don't think we're agenda. If it wasn't on the sure, no, meeting. all right, okay. and that's fine. They'll resign yeah. anyway. So. Um, I, I again. No, you're right. The board of resignations is on there, so I don't know why you can't include them into it because that's on the agenda. It's not a revisement. Only the names are a revisement. Why would I add okay. those two names? Um, add this one. All right. So for the resignations, there's also Julie Stacy, math teacher at James F. Dowdy School. Amy Trask, English teacher at Bangor High School. So moved. Second. Um, resignations don't need a vote. That's Sorry, just information. Um, but approval of extra duty assignments, I do have um, one other person, which would be Maureen Barron, varsity softball head coach at Bangor High School. So motion. Second. Discussion? Uh, Member Caruso? Yes. Member Hassanen? Yes. Member Hyatt? Yes. Member Mundell? Yes. Member Sorg? Yes. Member Surratt? Yes. And member stickers. Yes. And again, my apologies for the incorrect. So do we not have these, these introductory items and revised policies or any policy are they not on here? That's correct. Um, do I have any comments or questions from the committee? I, I have a question. Yes, member Surratt. And I apologize that you can't, I, I assume you can't see video. That is. We can't see you, but okay, but, but you can hear me fine. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I I wanted to ask a, a question about the Spruce leadership. Um, I, I wanted to get clarification on something. Um, at the previous meeting, uh, Member Mundell had had mentioned that it was her understanding that the executive director of Spruce needed to be a superintendent of one of the regional school districts and, and therefore, or the implication was that because former superintendent Webb is not currently a superintendent that there was an, an issue there. I, after reviewing the, the, the Spruce bylaws, it, that's not my understanding. And I, I really think we all need to be on the, the same page 
here, or I, I'd at least like to get clarification from somebody about about that particular point. Thank you, Member Surrett. Um, uh, Superintendent Hager, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to meet with Dr. Webb yet. Okay. I have. Yes, if you if if you're prepared to. Member Surrett, thank you for your your comment, and and we cannot see you, but we can hear you just fine. Um, I did speak with with ex Superintendent Webb, and we had a, a really good conversation. And the bylaws. Um, there's no reason that she could not be in that position for this year. And we're gonna work in tandem and I'm gonna learn learn from her. And so she is in that role for this this year. Does that Appreciate answer? that. Yes, it answers my, yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments from the committee? I, I do feel um, compelled since I was sort of the, the swing vote on this one to share that um, I, because of the Urser funds, I think we're gonna be able to take care of the schools. And um, personally, I've been in a situation where $30 was a lot of money. I mean, I know it doesn't seem like a lot to, to most of us up here, but that, that really meant that there was moments in my life where that, that represented whether my kids got to eat. Um, so I, I think I think that that's something to think about, especially in light of the funds that we are going to be receiving and what we're going to be doing with it. And I don't want anybody to misunderstand that I don't care about our teachers or our administrators or anything. If it wasn't for the URSA funds, my vote would have been very differently. Different. So, uh, yes, Member Hyatt. I, I would I would add, uh, Chair. Um, I, I think, you know, every everybody um, on this committee means well. We all want what is best for the students and for the population. Um, sometimes, you know, we may get a little heated. We have a difference in opinion, but that's good in a democracy. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, and everybody has stuff to bring to the table. And I, I nobody doubts uh, your commitment, uh, ma'am, and your love for the students and Thank staff. You. Yes, Member Caruso. I just I wanted to right. clarify with you that just because you voted last, you're not the swing vote. <laughs> well, this is true. It always feels like it's yeah, that. There were four votes <laughs> that, that agreed with you. And, and uh, again, the process is that, you know, we yes. vote on as a committee. And I would echo that, you know, with the $12.9 million in funding, we've, we've got a lot of opportunity to do the things that were discussed tonight and, and many yes. more. And many more. Um, and I, I, I just think it's, you know, a little bit of good citizenship, so to speak, to, to think of the whole, um, not everyone has a child in school. So a relief in taxpayers' money is is a good thing. Um, and so I think if you look at it as a whole, I think we're doing the right thing. And um, and I, I just want to make sure you didn't feel like, you know, you were the, you were, you were out there by yourself. You know, was, yes. Four of us have voted the same way. True, and, true. And that just because you vote last does not mean that. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I had, oh. oh, go ahead. Okay. Member Mundell, go ahead. I, I can wait. Yeah, um, I was gonna wait to, to section I. I. Is that when we're supposed to have general It could be comments? either one. Okay, I've been it's a little bit confused odd. about that. Okay, so I'll just say it now. Okay. Um, um, I agree with Member Hyatt that we all, I think we all have the kids well-being at heart and um, there are different ways of getting to the same end. And I also, just want to welcome Superintendent Tager, and uh, this was sort of a, a contentious welcome, <laughs> but um, I have a lot of trust in you um, for stewarding us, and I'm excited to see what's coming. So, um, um, welcome. Thank you. I appreciate that, and I do um, also also want to weigh in that I think that the dialogue is good, and I think that um, people do have differing opinions, and and I certainly. Appreciate that. I think everybody's hearts in the in the right place, and I think that we'll we'll get it right for students. It's a big um, opportunity, and I do um, to kind of um, mention what Member Caruso said is is this is a a very um, prestigious school district, and I think that we have to have a good working relationship with the city. And I've already been able to work with the city manager Kathy Conlow. And I understand she's leaving and we'll have somebody else, but I think that relationship is important for us. 
And, and as our chairperson said too, we are receiving um, ESSER dollars. So I do feel like this is the year where we could be good stewards to our community, to our city. And we also will be able to do some exciting things for our students, which is what this really is all about. So thank you all for the discussion. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I, yeah. I, I had, oh. Just to follow up um, real quick, which I, I meant to say before, I think um, when I was elected, I was elected on a reform platform and, um, and that's why I'm here because the voters wanted that. So I think, um, I think it's important for us to keep in mind that just because we've done things a certain way, it doesn't mean we have to keep doing them a certain way. And um, I think we should all um, take that to heart as we move forward. Thank you. And Member Surratt? Yes, I, I just had two quick comments. Um, uh, first, I, I, social studies education and civic literacy is a, a real passion of mine, and I just want to applaud the, the students for their, for their civic engagement on such an important issue uh, as voter literacy, and I, I look forward to, to hearing more from them and, and from the uh, organization that, that they represent. And the second comment I wanted to make is, is on the, the close votes. Uh, I'm always <laughs> glad, uh, member Sichters, that the second letter in your name is Y, uh, which uh, it follows after the second letter in my name. So, uh, But you are definitely not a swing vote, as, as Member Crusoe uh, mentioned. Thank you. And Member Sorg. Yes, I would like to add to this, uh, Member Surrett and Member Sictus, uh, O comes before a Y and a U, so I'm glad you're after me. <laughs> uh, and excellent. I also would like to welcome and thank Center, Superintendent Tagger for being here. And welcome. Uh, we're going to be a very diverse group. We don't always agree, but the point is, it's about the kids. Thank you. Right. Uh, do we have any representative reports? Uh, yes, Member Sorg. I don't have a report, but I do have a notification. UTC board will meet tomorrow night at 5.30 at UTC. Excellent. Thank you very, very much. Uh, yes. Um, can someone report on the scholarship committee? I don't think we heard about that committee. I'm not even sure who's on it, but uh, how, Carissa? I, I'm on the committee. I wasn't able to attend. Okay. Um, the, the, the theory of the committee report is that I'm there. <laughs> they don't award any of the scholarships at the time. It's more of a discussion of the financial situation, uh, which has always been really healthy. Um, so I don't, I don't have, a, I wasn't able to attend the meeting, so I don't have a lot to report, but the, the, generally speaking, not a lot to report, except maybe the, the total amount that we have in the endowment. And I don't know that off the top of my head. Sorry. I stumped you. I didn't mean to look your way, but. <laughs> no, we didn't. Oh. No, you didn't. The uh, scholarship investment account is over $2 million now. It's been uh, enjoying healthy earnings over the last few years, and we're able to present a full slate of scholarships like we have in the past. Uh, so, yeah. Some of those scholarships are endowed, and others are yearly yeah. contributions. I, is it 110, roughly, that we give? Yeah, sorry. I, so, so who makes the decisions about who gets the scholarships? Is that the school staff? There's a, there's a school staff okay. internal. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Um, any other reports? Okay. Um, some information items. We have some important dates coming up. Wednesday, August 18th is going to be our next uh, scheduled school committee meeting, 7 p.m. right here. Wednesday, September 1st is the first day of school. Woohoo! Um, on Thursday, September 9th, we have another regular meeting here at 7 p.m., followed by Wednesday, September 22nd, uh, 7 p.m. in the council chambers. Uh, do we have any other questions or comments from the committee? Um, so, uh, not quite yet. Um, I have three things. First off, I would like to thank Member Hassanen, who it is just about to hit 3 o'clock in the morning where she is. Um, we are incredibly grateful for you, uh, your commitment to the school and staying up this late because I would have been asleep on the table. So uh, thank you very, very much. We appreciate it. Um, we hope that you can join us for the executive session that's following here. Um, I'd also like to um, do a very formal welcome to our brand new superintendent, James Hager. Um, we are incredibly grateful that you are here. Um, none more so than probably Dr. Harris-Medford. <laughs> uh, 
um, who has had a smile on her face since I've seen her. Um, so thank you and welcome. And um, a very big thank you to Dr. Harris Medberg, who has just been an absolute joy to have as an interim um, and has just really done a great job shepherding us this past year and leave, leaving, leaving us in a good place for you. So um, I believe that we are ready to read into executive can session. I, yes. Can I jump in really quick and just, I wanted to echo uh, the hearty welcome to Dr., um, uh, Superintendent uh, Tager. Uh, I, I'm, I regret not being there. Of course, I'm halfway around the world, but you were on vacation while I was there and now I'm on vacation, but uh, welcome. And we are so excited to have you uh, with us. Um, we, we voted for you and we hired you because of your wonderful energy. And I think you'll really help us um, set, set a new tone for this new school year. And also um, thank you to Dr. Uh, Harris Medberg once again, um, we will miss seeing you with us, but <laughs> we know that you're not far. So thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for staying up so late for us. <laughs> I, I'm half asleep, but I'm here. <laughs> um, yes, are you ready to read us into executive yeah. session? Uh, we go in the executive session for the purpose of negotiation with the future program unit pursuant to one MRSA 456. I need a motion. I need a motion. Oh, I mean, I need a second. Second. Uh, discussion. Seeing none. Dr. Harris Nutberg. Yes. Sir. All right. <laughs> the order is off. It is. So, Member Spurs, Member Hassan. Yes. Member Hyatt. Yes. Member Mundell. Yes. Member Soar. Yes. Member Surratt. Yes. Yes. Okay, we are in exact.